on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and again we will start with listed questions. I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. S Deputy Speaker. Question number one, Minister. Deputy Speaker, to date neither I nor my officials have had any discussions with or received any submissions from the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People in relation to the proposed changes in legal aid for family law cases. The Commissioner did, however, provide a written response to the proposals for the reform of financial eligibility for civil and criminal legal aid. My officials are currently considering the responses to proposals to change civil legal aid remuneration, and I'm happy to meet with the Commissioner to discuss the policy proposals. Call Mrs. Kelly for supplementary. Um, thank uh, the Minister for his answer. I'm disappointed that there hasn't yet been, but there's certainly now an invitation to meet with the Children's Commissioner. Uh, the Minister will be aware of uh, the grave concern about the impact of legal aid changes on uh, representation at family, at family law courts. So would I, I ask the Minister then, will he take on board the concerns raised uh, by the Children's Law Society and others in relation to uh, the reduced uh, budget potential uh, uh, for representation at such hearings? Well, Deputy Speaker, I can certainly assure Mrs Kelly that we will take on board all the representations received, including those from the Children's Law Centre, but members will be aware of the difficult financial circumstances we're in, the necessity of ensuring that we bring legal aid expenditure within budget without reducing the scope of legal aid, and that remains my in intention. Call Mr Sean Lynch. Good uh, last can I call you. Can the Minister be satisfied that the proposed cuts to the legal aid budget for family law matters will not have negative impact on vulnerable children? Well, certainly, uh, Deputy Speaker, I have done my best to ensure that we will not see any cuts uh, which would affect the rights of uh, vulnerable claimants, whether they be children or others. Uh, that's part of the issue which, where we're looking at in terms of the review of the access to justice, looking at the needs of children and young people in particular. But I repeat the point I've just made to Mrs Kelly. There are very difficult financial circumstances, and we are maintaining the scope of legal aid significantly wider than it is in England and Wales. Call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister accept in the cases of implacable hostility, a parent may need the protection of the court to maintain a relationship with their child, and will legal aid still be available in these cases? Well, the answer, Deputy Speaker, is yes, I do accept that vulnerable parents may need legal aid and legal aid will continue to be available. What we have to do is ensure that the appropriate level of representation is provided, and I remain to be convinced that it is always necessary to provide the level of representation which is currently provided. Frequently, a solicitor would be capable of handling a case where, at the moment, uh, a junior barrister may be funded, a junior barrister may be capable of handling a case where currently a QC is funded. Call Mr Jim Allister. Has the Minister met with any solicitors? who are deeply exercised by his proposals in respect of particularly civil legal aid, uh, and many of whom have been lobbying members of this House. How many times has the Minister met with such solicitors to, to hear and to understand the concerns that they have? Well, Deputy Speaker, I attended a meeting convened by the Law Society some weeks ago, at which a very large number of solicitors were present. I have also met officers of the Law Society. I do not think it would be possible, given the number of firms of solicitors in this jurisdiction, for me to meet each of those individuals who has written either to the Department or to individual MLAs. Well, Mr Leslie Cree. Question two. Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Prison Service has evaluated millimetre wave scanners within the prison environment and has sought to obtain the necessary licences and approvals to pilot transmission X-ray body scanning technology within our prisons. In accordance with the Justification of Practices legislation, the required justification application was lodged with the Department of Energy and Climate Change in May. The process must now be completed by Chris Grayling, the Secretary of State for Justice, following consideration by the Justification Liaison Group. All of this is outside the control of my officials. While I remain determined to reduce the level of personal intrusion which is inherent within existing search procedures, any new solution must, as a minimum, perform at least as well as existing methods. Ultimately, nothing should be done that will compromise the safety of everyone within our prisons. Call Mr Cree for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister for his response, which is it's interesting. Minister, I wonder, and I understand the difficulties that you're having, is there any alternative technology which could be used uh, that would eliminate the requirement for full body searches? 
Well, at this stage, Deputy Speaker, I can inform Mr Cree for, to what is a fair supplementary question that the only two technologies which have been assessed as in any way possibly suitable were the millimetre wave scanners which we trialled and were found not to be suitable and the transmission X-ray scanners for which we are seeking uh, the justification approval. The reality is, even were they to be successful, they would not remove completely the need for full body searching. If, for example, they were to identify that something was secreted, it would then be a requirement to have that full body search. But there is, as I am aware at this stage, no other technology beyond those two, although we keep in touch with developments worldwide. Call Mr Pat Ramsey. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, given it is a, a most emotive subject matter and the concerns with that, and accepting there are statutory requirements in relation to the scanners, has there been any independent assessment or evaluation carried out into the suitability of these full body scanners? Well, I, again, I appreciate Mr Ramsey's point. The reality is that the Northern Ireland Prison Service is at the forefront within these islands of looking at this particular technology. It is in use in airports, but it is not in use in any uh, prison or similar facility uh, anywhere in these islands. That is why we're having to go through the detail of the justification application, and that is why the matters are technically out of our hands at the moment. We simply await to see what the response to that application is. Call Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and indeed thank the Minister for his answers. But given the timescale that we are now involved in this process seeking uh, a licence, is the Minister satisfied that the proper urgency is being provided, or is this a case of people not really wanting to do this and, and looking ways to try and just slow it down? Well, I, I can't give Mr McCartney the assurances as to what processes are entirely being applied by DEC, but what I can say is that meetings have been held, prison service staff have been at them. We have done our best to push forward that this is an important and urgent issue for us. But clearly there is a major issue about a completely new technology being used within prisons, and it's only right that that should be subjected to proper assessments on health grounds. Call Mr Cathal Washing. Question three. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is very positive ongoing cooperation between the various criminal justice agencies across the two jurisdictions. This reveals itself most notably through the six project advisory groups covering public protection, managing offenders, forensic science, victims and witnesses, youth justice and criminal justice and social diversity. Cooperation is developing further in areas including work to speed up justice by sharing best practice on the production of short or fast track reports for courts the drafting and development of a forensic partnership strategy and action plan, which covers the forensic science services of Northern Ireland, Ireland and Scotland, the holding of a cross-border hate crime seminar, ongoing discussions on the European Victims Directive, development of an information sharing agreement between the PSNI and Angada Shikana relating to domestic and child abuse, and development of a protocol between the juvenile justice centres in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Call Mr Oshin for supplementary. Uh, could the Minister give an update on the All-Ireland approach to dealing with uh, human trafficking? Well, the issue of human trafficking, you would appreciate, Deputy Speaker, is one uh, which, as I will be announcing shortly in my statement on the, uh, the North-South meeting, uh, is a matter of key concern in both jurisdictions. It's an issue where we see joined up working between Angada Shikana and the PSNI in particular, and through the involvement of Angada Shikana in the Organised Crime Task Force subgroup on human trafficking. Uh, back in October, uh, Alan Shatter's Minister of Justice and Equality and I uh, opened and co hosted a cross border forum on human trafficking to uh, enable the various agencies to identify the challenges and seek cooperative solutions. And we're looking currently at a number of bids for EU funding in respect of the education around trafficking and of meeting the needs of victims. So they're all matters which are of considerable concern to a number of agencies north-south and on which the two of us as ministers continue to discuss regularly. Call Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Given the importance of cross-border cooperation, what action is the minister taking to ensure that the response by the Garda Commissioner uh, to ACC Drew Harris's evidence uh, is properly dealt with and doesn't jeopardise that relationship, or does the Minister intend to continue with his political expediency of being blasé about the Smithwick Tribunal report? 
It is very difficult to answer a question which is based on an utterly false premise, Deputy Speaker. Stating the, re stating the reality that a few bad apples does not mean that an entire force is corrupt is a simple statement of fact, whether or not some members in this House like it or not. That is not being blasé, that is being utterly factual. In terms of dealing with the issues arising through the Swithick Report, I have had discussions on that informally on a number of occasions last week with Alan Shatter, TD. The two of us will be having a formal meeting, as I said uh, earlier in the House, with the Garda Commissioner and the PSNI Chief Constable, and we will be ensuring that we do maintain the best possible joined up working. Uh, I certainly accept that there was a difficulty within the last few days uh, between the Garda Barrister and ACC Drew Harris. Uh, the assurance I have from the Minister for Justice and Equality is that he accepts, as Judge Smith accepted, the evidence that Drew Harris presented to the Tribunal. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his uh, uh, replies to questions. Uh, but in relation to cross border cooperation, uh, would the Minister uh, consider seriously, along with his colleague in the South, uh, the setting up of a model of intelligence exchange uh, based on the integrated border intelligence team? made up of agencies from the United States and Canada, as recommended uh, by Judge Smithick. Well, I thank Mr McGuinness for that question, because it's a very significant way of reflecting uh, the need to ensure the best possible joining up. Uh, I actually was uh, out this morning with PSNI officers and HMRC officers on an issue directed against fuel laundering. Uh, that was very close to the border near Cullerville in South Armagh. And on that operation, there was direct cross-border cooperation using the same radio system, vehicle to vehicle, between the PSNI and Garda Shikana. That's an example of positive movement forward. The issue of intelligence sharing, of course, is one which can also feature into agencies which are not my devolved responsibility. But the lessons to be learnt, as highlighted by Judge Smithick, are lessons that I am determined to learn, and I believe Alan Shatter shares my concerns. Call Mr. Michael Copeland for a question. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Deputy Speaker, the Home Secretary announced recently that the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, currently operating on a pilot basis in specific locations in England and Wales, will be rolled out across England and Wales from March next year. Department of Justice officials have been liaising with colleagues in the Home Office throughout the duration of the pilot scheme. The evaluation arising from it will be shared with the Regional Strategy Group on Domestic and Sexual Violence, which will consider the potential to introduce a domestic violence disclosure scheme in Northern Ireland. Call Mr Copeland for a supplement. Um, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could, could he share with us any details that he may have regarding the success or other ways of this scheme where it has been introduced in these pilots in the rest of the UK? Well, I don't have the detailed, Deputy Speaker, um, of the, the scheme as it was implemented by the Home Office, but my officials will certainly be seeking the most detailed information possible on it. Certainly what we do have uh, is the option of potentially two different kinds of process for disclosing information, whether it be um, on the opportunity for a member of the public to have the right to ask, or the potential to, of disclosure to a uh, you know, prospective victim, what is described as the right to know. Both of them can be implemented within the England and Wales arrangements. The important issue is to see that we get that message across uh, within Northern Ireland. And certainly there is already an informal amount of sharing with the PSNI anyway. Call Ms. Rosalie McCarley. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, in relation to the recent negative report into domestic violence, which was carried out by the Criminal Justice Inspectorate. Can the Minister um, assure us that uh, those recommendations will be implemented as soon as possible? Well, the job, of course, for that largely falls to the Regional Strategy Group on Domestic and Sexual Violence, uh, but I can assure all members of the House that reports from Sijini are taken seriously within the Department and will be seeking to ensure that those recommendations are followed up in the most appropriate way. Call Ms. Karen uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, um, will he ensure that all victims of uh, domestic abuse are offered um, special measures when involved in court proceedings? I can't give an assurance in quite the way that question was asked. 
Um, but I would have thought that the reality is the great majority of victims of domestic abuse will find themselves eligible for special measures uh, to give a blanket guarantee that all victims in all circumstances will re uh, receive an entitlement to special measures is beyond me as Minister at this point. Ms. Anna Lou for a question. Question number five, please. Deputy Speaker, key to the reform of prisons is putting the offender at the centre of the prison system, assessing his or her needs and working in partnership to address these, aiding successful reintegration to the community on release and making society safer by doing so. Indeed, education, training and employment is one of the key resettlement pathways to which the prison service has committed itself. Reflecting that, one of this year's business targets was that NIPS would for the first time publish an employability strategy by March of 2014. The strategy was in fact published on the 20th of September. It is a four-year strategy covering the period 2013 to 2017, linking the opportunities available to prisoners with employment market trends and opportunities through the delivery of a range of services. One of those services must be a modernised learning and skills service. I'm glad to inform members that work is well underway to put a revised curriculum and outsourced delivery model during 2015 with employment skills training one of the core elements. In terms of employment, a range of initiatives are currently under development and a new passport to employment, which was developed by prisoners and aims to capture soft skills in addition to qualifications gained, is being piloted in McGavery. Call Ms Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the Minister uh, for outlining uh, some of the more strategic policy initiatives. But can the Minister uh, give us some examples of how the outworking of these policies and strategies are beginning to be seen on the ground. Well, I, th I thank the member for the supplementary. I'm not quite sure how much is available on the ground, but let me talk a little about what is available within the institutions. Um, we've already seen, for example, good progress. Um, members may have seen reference to a social enterprise which I launched a couple of weeks ago in Hyde Bank Wood entitled Mugshots. Um, I'm sure I sh probably shouldn't do a commercial, but I will anyway, Deputy Speaker. If anybody is looking for either mugs, T-shirts, um, carrier bags, or similar articles to be printed with the, um, the logo of any institution, mugshots can do a very good range for you. Um, five prisoners are currently undergoing a business mentoring scheme with business in the community. Uh, I refer to the Passport to Employment, which is looking at the issue of soft skills as well as specific qualifications in McGavery. Um, a number of prisoners were interviewed by the Timpson Group for 16-week work placements and two are already on placement with other interviews scheduled for, I think, next week. Um, and there's also work being done by the UK-wide Employers Forum for Reducing Reoffending, um, where the Timpson Company has a very significant role which will lead to some opportunities in McGabry in February. So those are key examples where things are moving forward. We also would hope that we'll be seeing within the very near future the publication of the prospectus for High Bank College as we seek to transfer uh, the, uh, the running of the YOC into a, a mechanism more suited to meeting the needs of offenders to provide them with the skills for when they return. Call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, third time. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've listened very carefully to what the Minister has said in, in relation to his response to this question. And my concern is always around the victims of violence. What message does he think this would send out to victims, and will he ensure that the sensitivities and the needs of victims are also considered whenever any new programmes are being introduced for prisoners? Well, Deputy Speaker, I entirely agree with Lord Morrow about the importance we should place on the needs of victims, and indeed, that's why we have put in place the Victims of Witness Strategy. Uh, to show the importance of that. But in the specific context of rehabilitating those who are in prisons, uh, in order to make this society safer by having fewer victims in the future, then I believe we do have a specific obligation to put a lot of effort into that rehabilitation work. And a key part of that is what I've just been highlighting around employability. Call Michaela Boyle. Um, does the Minister agree that when prisoners are not engaged in purposeful activity, the process of rehabilitation is fundamentally undermined? Gormogut? I certainly do agree, Deputy Speaker, which is why we're hoping 
uh, that under the new arrangements for Hyde Bank Wood, we will be seeking to have close on 30 hours per week of constructive activity, whether related to education, skills or employment uh, within Hyde Bank Wood for that particular group of prisoners, and we will be seeking to make similar changes in the other institutions as well. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. In terms of Hyde Bank Wood, Minister, what progress is made in terms of the development of education and training services there? Well, I hope that we will be outsourcing the education skills provisions formally within the very near future. Uh, I referred to the prospectus for the college, which is very close to, uh, to finalisation. Um, Members will appreciate that this is a very significant and fundamental change to the running of the College, and that is why, with the new Governor in place and a task force established to look at that particular work, uh, we are seeking to make that major transformation over the coming months. Certainly, when I visited the Monkshots Enterprise, it to me was a very positive example as to how one relatively small group of prisoners had already seen the opportunity to do something more constructive, but it is a challenge to get that rolled out to as many prisoners as possible. Well, Mr. John McAllister for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number six. De Deputy Speaker, I welcome the report from Sir Ginny and thank the inspectors and staff for their thorough and informative review. I ask Sir Ginny to carry out the review to get us a better understanding of the cost and impact on the criminal justice system of dealing with our past. The report puts the estimated cost at around £30 billion this year. In the next five years, at current estimates and allowing for inflation, it is projected to exceed £180 million therefore is a low-end and conservative estimate. The report recognises the significant efforts made across the justice system to deal with our past. However, it also highlights the challenges the system faces, both in terms of dealing with the past and delivering an effective justice system now and for the future. It is a further reminder that dealing with the past is not simply a justice issue. It is for all of us across government and civic society. Mr McAllister, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for his reply. Uh, the Minister has stated on previous occasions that without uh, agreed and properly resourced structures to deal with the past, both within, within and outside our justice system, there is a significant risk to public confidence would be undermined um, in dealing with the past and legacy issues. Does the Minister have a proposal on how the structures to deal with the past might be paid for? Well, Deputy Speaker, whilst I appreciate Mr McAllister's question, I think at this point of the discussions between the various parties under the chairmanship of Dr Richard Haas and Dr Megan O'Sullivan, it would be a foolish member of this House who was to set out their plans, uh, given that they might be contradicted by an agreed process within the week. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Does the Minister put a, a financial cost on dealing with the past? Does he think that, that is appropriate for victims? Well, Deputy Speaker, Mr Nesbitt makes a reasonable point, but I can only answer the question I was asked about the estimated costs, and I have some answer to that. There is, of course, a real issue for this society as to how we deal with the past, how we address the needs of victims, how we deal with the, uh, the fact that some people have benefited from a very expensive inquiry and others won't. The ongoing work of the HET, the Police Ombudsman and Inquest, all have costs, but all are less than completely satisfactory ways of meeting the needs of society as a whole and specific individual victims. So I take the point Mr Nesbitt is making. I was asked about the costs and I have given the costs, but it is a much wider issue and it is an issue that goes way beyond the justice system. Call Mr Ian McCree for a question. Question number seven. Deputy Speaker, statistics provided by the PSNI indicate that drug seizures and arrests have seen upward trends over the past three years. The Organised Crime Task Force Report 2013 noted that the drugs market in Northern Ireland has seen extensive change over the past few years, mirroring that seen in other parts of the UK and Europe. Further, while cannabis continues to be the main drug used in Northern Ireland, the emergence of new psychoactive substances has been challenging for law enforcement, together with a growing market in prescription drugs being bought over the internet. The Department of Justice is a major contributor to the outcomes defined in the Executive's New Strategic Direction for Alcohol and Drugs 2011-16, which is led by DHSSPS, where the aim is to reduce drug and alcohol-related harm in Northern Ireland. In addition, my department's community safety strategy reflects the outcomes contained within the New Strategic Direction, and my department and its agencies are working with key stakeholders to deliver those outcomes. 
Call Mr. McCrae for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister has referred to the increased year on year in the number of detections for, for drugs. And whilst that's welcome, it's obviously something that is deeply saddening as well that there is so many people who continue to deal with drugs. Can the Minister give an, an assurance that he, along with the Minister for Health um, and the, the PSNI, will do everything they can to ensure that? These drug dealers who are a scourge in our society are removed from our streets and that everything is done to get the appropriate ev evidence to um, not only um, to arrest these people but to bring them to justice. Well, I certainly agree with the point Mr McRae is making, although he does encourage me to stray into operational policing matters. But I can say that I'm aware of a very significant operation being carried out in Belfast against drug dealers by the PSNI. We could also highlight the work which is being done around the Gabri prison jointly between the PSNI and the prison service. So there is a lot of work being done. And there's also the issue around more of the education and treatment factor, which lies with the Department of Health, but where we are working in partnership where it's appropriate as well. So I take the point that more needs to be done, but more needs to be done on a very much joined up approach. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer up until now. Uh, can the Minister outline for us, please, just what measures are being taken within prisons uh, to try and curtail the availability and usage of drugs within those facilities, please? Well, there are a number of measures being adopted in prisons, Deputy Speaker. Um, first of all is a robust and intelligence-led approach to searching relating to the potential of smuggling of drugs, um, action being taken by the PSNI externally against visitors. Uh, the education function, which lies more with health, is also a key important part. Um, issues like managing supervised swallow of prescription drugs to ensure that prescription drugs do not end up uh, being uh, traded amongst prisoners. Uh, particularly when some who need those drugs uh, are being forced into hand them over to others. All of those are key issues of the fight which is being conducted against drugs in partnership between the prison service, the PSNI and the South Eastern Trust. Question number eight is withdrawn and will receive a written answer. Uh, I call Lord Morrow. Number nine, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, annual savings in operating costs from the closure of the hearing centres are estimated at £228,000. In addition, the closures addressed a potential unfunded capital pressure of £1,728,000 to maintain the buildings and meet Disability Discrimination Act requirements. When I announced the closures, I indicated that my decision was not based on monetary considerations alone. The hearing centres were not able to provide the level of accommodation and facilities that court users, including victims and witnesses, expect. The transfer of business to alternative larger court venues goes some way to addressing this issue. Call Lord Barrow for supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for his reply. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, if I am right, I understand that one of the court services that was up for closure was Turban. I understand it has been removed from the list. Are any other centres pending removal, or is the programme going ahead as planned? And could I just finally say the savings seem very little for the inconvenience I think is going to be caused? Well, Deputy Speaker, Lord Morrow talks about inconvenience, and we do have to weigh up what inconvenience may amount to. Although there was a certain amount of uh, comment uh, when Larne and Bangor holding, uh, hearing centres were closed. There was, to the best of my knowledge, not a single comment came in subsequent to those closures suggesting that there was a major problem. And indeed, there's definitely a, a better set of conditions for those who use the courthouses in the alternative venues than was the case in the small uh, centres, which were, as I said in my main statement, unsuitable under the disability <coughs> discrimination legislation. Um, in terms of the, the wider position, the other two co uh, courthouses which were earmarked for closure can only be closed when uh, changes have been made to the court's boundary system, which is, is awaiting further legislation. But there is an overall issue of the Department of Justice estate strategy, which may well affect other uh, smaller centres in the future. But that is a matter which is currently underway. Order. That ends the period for oral questions.
We will now move on to those topical questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Uh, can I ask the Minister to take this opportunity to outline the timeline and process for the proposed consultation on amending the law relating to fatal fetal abnormality? Well, I can only give the House a general outline. Uh, as I said last week in response to questions from the media, uh, the likelihood is that a, publication, uh, a document will be published for consultation before Easter time of next year. This is because of the, uh, the situation that arose um, when uh, the matter was being looked at it in terms of the guidance, which is the responsibility of DHS-SPS, when the Minister of Health made clear last week uh, that it was not possible to deal with the issue of fatal fetal abnormality under any reform to DHS-SPS guidelines. He made it clear that the matter then lay as criminal law with the Department of Justice. And in response to questions from the media, I gave that general indication. But matters are at an early stage of drawing up the consultation document. And members will also be aware, of course, that I reported last May that we were looking at the issue of a consultation on the issue of the premises on which uh, abortions could be performed. So this is now feeding into that also to look at the issue of fatal fetal abnormality. Call Mr Michael Duff for supplementary. Can I ask the Minister to provide an assurance that the consultation will be as broad and as thorough as possible and that such a consultation will fully involve this Assembly? I think, Deputy Speaker, that has been the case with every one of the very many consultations DOJ has done in the last three and a half years, and I can assure Mr Michael Duff I'm not changing my way of doing things now. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. On the same issue, can I ask the Minister if he could clarify uh, for the Assembly the circumstances in which he issued a statement to the media last week in relation to the consultation on abortion law? Uh, the circumstances were, broadly as I outlined to Mr. McElduff, at question time last Tuesday, the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety confirmed that it was not possible to deal with the issue of fatal fetal abnormality under the revised guidelines. Uh, the DOJ had been holding off on its role on the consultation around abortion until we established uh, what the DHS-SPS guidelines might manage in that respect. Once it was confirmed that that was not the case, I believe the Minister of Health was contacted by the media and asked for a statement of his position. I was certainly contacted by the media and asked for a statement of mine and made it clear that having given the undertaking that DOJ would deal with the issue if DHS-SPS could not, it then became clear that the matter fell to us and I answered in the affirmative. It was not an announcement of the consultation details, it was an announcement of what the process will be. Call Mr Little for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his clarification. Can I ask the Minister uh, how this will relate to the consultation in relation to abortion law that he committed to earlier this year? I believe, Deputy Speaker, that uh, we will have um, potentially a number of issues to consider around the matter of abortion. But what was clear was uh, at the point when the Assembly did not pass an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill, which would have rendered uh, abortions which were otherwise lawful, unlawful if not performed on health service premises, uh, at that stage it fell to the DOJ to look at a consultation around that aspect of abortion law. Uh, what was clear then was we, we got wrapped up further into the issue of fatal fetal abnormality, and it was appropriate to await uh, the uh, DHS-SPS resolution at that point. That having now been re resolved from the health point of view, there will be a single consultation looking at all the relevant aspects of abortion law in the spring of next year. Call Mr Pat Ramsey for a topic. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Justice Minister what discussions he has had with the Chief Constable? or any other agencies in Northern Ireland regarding the criminal investigation on the Bloody Sunday? I have not discussed the issue of the criminal investigation into Bloody Sunday specifically with the Chief Constable. Obviously, I discuss issues of uh, such matters generally with the Chief Constable, but as I understand it, the issue fell to the Chief Constable operationally to deal with the issue following the outcome of the Savile Report. Well, Mr Ramsey, for some <coughs> I thank the Minister Albio. I wouldn't be content with his response. As Justice Minister, you do you not feel you have a responsibility and duty of care to ensure and give reassurance to those families whose loved ones were murdered on Bloody Sunday? 
to give them some hope for the future and the foreseeable future that accountability will take place and then a criminal investigation will commence? Well, Deputy Speaker, I share Mr Ramsey's concern, but I cannot give an assurance to the bereaved families as to how operational policing will be carried out in an area which is precisely the responsibility of the Chief Constable. I cannot uh, direct him what, invasion, what investigations to carry out or not to carry out, and we would be in a very bad way if I could. I appreciate the concerns which Mr Ramsey has put forward, but they are concerns which are operational matters for the Chief Constable and not for the Minister. Mr Declan McAleer is not in his place. I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, um, as I understand that he attended the European Justice and Home Affairs Council recently in Brussels. Um, could the Minister provide a brief, a brief uh, overview of some of the key issues discussed at that meeting uh, in relation to here in Northern Ireland? Deputy Speaker, it's always concerning when one of my colleagues asks me to be brief twice. Um, I had the opportunity to both to address formal sessions of the Justice and Home Affairs Council and to have a number of other meetings around that, uh, which included representation, uh, the UK uh, government representation, the Northern Ireland Executive Office, and indeed the Irish representation, uh, to see some of the work which is being done at Europe that we need in Europe, which we need to join up with. Um, I had uh, one useful meeting. Uh, with staff from the Commission who are looking at the issue of what they call the de-radicalisation agenda, which obviously across most of Europe is uh, directed against those who are on the fringes of Islamic terrorism, but it was also seen to be the potential that looking at experience in Northern Ireland that we could both contribute and benefit from such discussion. I had a specific meeting which was extremely useful with the EU anti-trafficking coordinator discussing Northern Ireland's position with regard to the directive. Um, Whilst it's certainly not my place to uh, indicate what her view was, um, she will have to make an assessment of where Northern Ireland stands. She did not lead me to believe that Northern Ireland was other than in a good place around trafficking matters. And indeed, um, I said she might well wish to come and visit Northern Ireland to see uh, the situation on the ground. And I would be suggesting to the Justice Committee that they may well wish to take evidence from her as part of their review of Lord Morrow's bill. And indeed, Lord Morrow may wish to meet her himself. I think it would be useful. And I say that um, knowing that she didn't agree entirely with everything that I was saying, but I believe that she has a specific role in the EU that we should take note of. Call Mr McCarthy for right. supplementary. Thank the Minister for making a brief statement and a brief reply, as normally does. But in relation to following, following on from the, the human trafficking issue, were there any uh, learning points that could be factored into our approach to this issue uh, or into the legislation currently being um, considered uh, here at home? Well, the House would expect me to say that, of course, we have got the legislation in a very good place as it is. Um, but I think we do always need to learn, and it will be interesting to see when she produces her reports of what uh, Mrs. Basilidou uh, suggests about Northern Ireland, about other similar jurisdictions, what we may learn from each other. Um, I think it would probably also be appropriate at this point to say that having had a, a useful discussion last week with Lord Morrow about the, the uh, Department's attitude to aspects of his bill, I believe that we are getting a better joined up system within Northern Ireland, which I think will put us at the forefront of work being done in Europe. Call Mr Ian Milne for talking to Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, Minister, uh, do you believe that there are organised groups involved in the recent spat of thefts? Um, of cattle and farm machinery from farm holdings? Well, I don't have any specific in information as to exactly what way um, thefts like cattle thefts are being uh, organised, Deputy Speaker. There clearly is an issue in some parts of Northern Ireland as there is an issue about rural crime generally, but I'm not sure that I have the specific information which would give any particular benefits on that point. What is important is that we see as ever a joined up approach, that we see cooperation between uh, the relevant agencies, that we see the kind of good work being done by PCSPs uh, to deal with some rural crime issues being carried forward. Um, and I certainly hope that what we will see from the Rural Crime Unit, which is a joint operation between NFU Mutual, the police and my department, that we will be able to identify trends and better fight them. Mr. Mellon, for supplementary. Era Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers uh, thus far. 
Does the Minister feel that measures that, has been, that he has in place with his counterparts in the 26 counties are effective uh, in combating the increasing problem that we have in the rural areas? Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm not particularly aware that the, the rural crime uh, that we face at the moment is particularly a cross-border issue, though I am aware, for example, of um, some items of valuable machinery which have been taken across border and indeed across the water and even in some cases to continental Europe. So it is an issue where the sort of work being done by the Organised Crime Task Force joining up on a cross-border basis will be useful. But it's very difficult to establish trends in what is uh, a, a difficult and complex area. And clearly, there is some rural crime which is not agricultural crime. We need to address that at the same time as we address issues like machinery theft and cattle rustling. Call Mr. John McAllister for public. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, on the question of uh, uh, his abortion consultation and the, the guidance around that, um, can I ask the Minister? Is this a case of one minister passing responsibility to another because he doesn't want to face up to the responsibilities of dealing with this issue? I'm sure the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Deputy Speaker, would not really ask any minister to criticise any other minister in the House on any circumstances. Um, I think the, re the reality is that we are in the, the slightly unusual position that the guidelines relating to abortion were a matter for the Minister of Health, but the criminal law relating to abortion <coughs> is a matter of the Minister for Justice. And those are the, you know, that's the, the reality of the challenge. When, when the matter passed beyond guidelines, then it became clearly a matter for the Justice Department. I don't think, um, much as Mr McAllister might uh, wish to encourage me to criticise uh, my ministerial colleague, Edwin Poots, I don't think it's the case that he has ducked it. I think he has, you know, he has carried the, uh, the issue to, you know, as far as he can. And it's clearly an issue that the very difficult challenge of how we manage fatal fetal abnormality cannot be dealt with by health measures alone. Call Mr McAllister for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, he's absolutely right. I would have been quite content if he had criticised his ministerial colleague. Um, I'm surprised them showing a rare uh, effort of collective responsibility. Um, could I then take from the Minister's question, and uh, is this correct, that if he is changing the law, and if he's successful in changing the law and clarifying the law around fatal fetal abnormality, will it be his department that will publish the guidelines or the Department of Health? Well, Deputy Speaker, the, the guidelines, uh, which uh, were a court directive to the Department of Health, whether they be the responsibility of Mr. Poots, Mr. Wells, or anybody else at particular times in the future, the um, the issue of setting the criminal law is an issue not just for me, but for this Assembly as representing the people of Northern Ireland, but the specific departmental responsibility falls to the DOJ. So we, uh, we need to be clear of, of the difficulty of getting that joined up approach, but I do believe that we have the option to do it. We will have to see that we get the law right, and then hopefully we won't need guidelines to explain it. Call Ms. B. of McLaughlin. Uh, would the Minister agree that the recent book by Anne Cadwalder and the Panorama documentary highlights that the uh, rot rotten apple in the barrel theory is, is merely wishful thinking? No, Deputy Speaker, I wouldn't. <laughs> Could we have a supplementary, please? I'm a bit extremely disappointed uh, with the Minister's response, but can I ask the Minister directly then, how many instances of collusion in different places, in different years, by different British state organisations, does it actually take for him to accept that collusion was both systematic and endemic? As I've said many times before in this House, Deputy Speaker, I am responsible for devolved justice matters for the last three and a half years. My, my opinion is no more worth it well than any other member of this House's opinion in an area on which I have, for which I have no responsibility and, more to the point, no information. Uh, we just could get one very short question from Mr Sean Lynch, and I would appreciate members not shouting from a sedentary position. That does not help. I'll get to the last one, call you. Does the Minister agree that more needs to be done to try and warn those who get involved in, 
illegal activities such as protests and end up with a criminal record? Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, I could only echo the comments made by the current Chairman of the Parades Commission in his media interview at the weekend when he pointed out the number of young people who have acquired criminal records because they had been misled over street protests. And, of course, it's, that's not the only way in which young people get misled into criminal activity, but it is a salutary reminder of what can happen when people follow the lead of those who do not have their best interests at heart. We don't have time for a supplementary because time is up. And that concludes question time. I invite members.